Welcome, my name is Matthew Charles McGinley. I am the resident docent here at Historic Auburn, and today I'm gonna to give you the fascinating architectural history of this historic home. This house was built for a man named Lyman Harding who came down here all the way from Boston, Massachusetts. He came down to Mississippi in the year 1807 to defend Aaron Burr during his Mississippi arraignment for treason. This house was built by a man named Levi Weeks, who was a famed architect from New York City, who goes on to build several other homes here in Natchez, Mississippi, after he builds this one here, starting in 1811. The staircase behind me is his piece de resistance. It is a completely free-floating, 360-degree spiral staircase. It does not cantilever on the wall anywhere, and it has no center support structure. It connects at the bottom, and then directly above it at the top. It is also one continuous piece of railing. It's all made out of walnut, but it starts over here on one side and then travels all the way upstairs, curves around the Nautilus shell shape, and then comes back down the other side. This staircase is a feat of architectural engineering. It is completely comprised of cypress, and it is mortise and tenon construction, so there is no metal in the formation of this staircase. Now, we talk a lot about this staircase, and that's because it is so impressive. It is actually only one of three here in the United States, and it is the oldest of those three in the United States. This was constructed in 1812. The house's architect and builder, Levi Weeks, 1776 to 1819, described the construction of this house in September of 1812, letter to his friend Epiphras Hoyt of Deerfield, Massachusetts. The brick house I am building is just without the city line and is designed for the most magnificent building in the territory. The body of this house is two stories with a geometrical staircase to ascend to the second story. This is the first house in the territory on which was ever attempted any of the orders of architecture. The site is one of those peculiar situations which combines all the delight of romance, the pleasure of rurality, and the approach of sublimity, the owner of it is a Yankee, a native of our own state, Massachusetts. His name is Lyman Harding. This house was given to the city of Natchez in the year 1911 by the heirs of the Duncan family, who later took over after Lyman Harding sadly died in 1820. Now, the house was left empty for quite a long time, from 1911 until about the first pilgrimage here in 1932. And while the house was empty, quite a few things ended up going missing. Here, if you look, we have uh, the ghost mark of where there used to be an ivory finial on both sides of the staircase. It was very likely stolen for its very high value and trade at the time. While the house was left empty as well, a lot of the faux bois was damaged. And all of the doors as well as everything along this staircase, except for essentially the white plaster, was all done in a flame mahogany faux bois. It certainly didn't make sense at the time to have an artisan come in here and restore the faux bois because that would take a lot of money and a lot of time. And they were trying to get this house flipped over so that it could be viewed for one of the first pilgrimages solely surrounding historic architecture, so it got painted white. Now we know all of this because we did have an architectural conservator come here in April or May of last year. Her name is Brooke Russell, and she did all of the microscopy that we have on display here for the tours. So we know that all the doors, as well as the staircase, was flame mahogany, but we were also able to decipher the original paint campaign that was here in this T-shaped hall. What microscopy essentially is, is when you take a chunk out of the wall, flip it over on its side, and then examine it under the microscope, we can see all the individual paint layers and campaigns that were used in this front hall throughout all of time, 1812 to present. So in 1812, on the woodwork, we have this very light cream color, and on the plaster at the earliest layer, we have a peachy pink color that was often described as the most flattering color to a woman's complexion by candlelight. It was enormously popular throughout the federal period. Now, the design for this staircase came out of the British Paines Palladio out of 1735. So it's already actually a revival period by the time it comes here to the United States, about 75 years later. Now, the center hall of this home is actually designed in the shape of a capital T, and that is largely to show off this incredible feat of architectural engineering that is our staircase here at Auburn. You walk in the front door, the door swings open to the staircase, and you are immediately greeted with this big ribbon of a staircase. Now, if we look up and we see the top of the T, it then goes straight down this hall and we can see the barrel-coved ceiling that was essentially the calling card of Levi Weeks. Every single home that he designs in Natchez after he builds this home in 1812 all has this barrel-coved ceiling. Mm -hmm. 
Now that you've joined me here in the formal living room, I would like to draw your attention to the Salmon's Palladio Londenesis. We have this book here from 1738, and these were the books that they got all of their designs out of. All of the architects would have these books to show to their patrons, where their patrons could have picked out their architraves and entablatures, their mantelpieces, their cornice pieces, every bit of architectural element that they would like to have in their home could be picked out of one of these books, almost as if it was a catalog. So we know that Levi Weeks had a copy of the Salmon's Palladio Londenesis because he designs the exact same architraves and entablatures that are behind you. So behind me, you can see those famed architraves and entablatures that were very likely carved by Levi Weeks himself. He was a famed wood carver and master wood turner in New York City before he came down to Natchez, Mississippi. Now, while we're talking about Levi Weeks, it's important to note that he was also a famed murderer, not only a famed woodcarver and wood turner. In 1798, he was engaged to be married to a woman named Julioma Sands, who was the niece of the boarding house owner in which he was staying. He's seen out with her one night, and then she is not seen again until three days later she's discovered in the bottom of a Manhattan well. In Manhattan in 1798, they were very concerned about things ending up in those wells, but they weren't necessarily concerned about people. There was an entire company called the Manhattan Well Company, whose sole job was to guard those wells 24-7. There was a guard at those wells to make sure that nothing could be thrown over. Germ theory had not yet been invented yet and wouldn't even come into play until about another 80 to 90 years, but they knew that if, say, a stray cat were to fall over into the well, it would spell disaster for the entire city. Now, major members of that Manhattan Well Company were Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton, as well as his brother, Ezra Weeks. So when his fiance was found dead in the bottom of one of those wells, all signs pointed back to Levi Weeks. Now, Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton came to his defense because they were a part of that Manhattan Well Company, and it is the first transcribed murder trial in U.S. history. So if you're at all interested, you can read through all of the minutes. There's also been a novel that's written about it, and that is called The Manhattan Well Mystery, that details all accounts of this nefarious murder trial in 1798 in New York City. It is also actually widely mentioned in some of the song lyrics in the show Hamilton in New York City. Now, being the incredible attorneys that they are, Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton are able to get Levi Weeks acquitted. However, it ruined his reputation. He was essentially run out of New York City on a rail, until he was called upon by Lyman Harding to come down and build this palatial mansion in 1811. This mansion actually restores his reputation as a famed architect, and he goes on to build three other houses here, such as the Briars, which is actually on tour for pilgrimage this year. Now, this mantle that you see over here is not original to the home. The original mantle would have been carved out of Cyprus, again, very likely by Levi Weeks himself, and it would have been federal in style, where this is Greek revival. It was about 1850 to 1856 that the Duncan family started making a lot of major changes to this house, including the east and the west wings that we have here. Now, if you would, please join me in the dining room, and I'll introduce you to the Duncan family. Now, here in the dining room, before I introduce you to Stephen Duncan, I would like to point out the chandelier. Now, we know that there was never any piped gas in this house. We have extant photographs from this dining room from about 1920 to 1930 that show that the most updated chandelier in this house was actually a kerosene chandelier. But here we have a gasolier that is Cornelius and Baker, and it's probably around 1857, and it's a hunter theme. It was very generously donated to this house, as there was no chandelier here at the time, but it is not exactly appropriate for a dining room. While everything that you see on that chandelier can technically be eaten, usually themes that are included in dining room chandeliers or dining rooms in general are usually a cornucopia, uh, either fruit or vegetable, not usually elk or dead fowl. Now, the man that you see behind me is Dr. Stephen Duncan, who came down here from Carlisle, Pennsylvania in about the year 1808, and he ended up marrying into the wealthiest planter family here in Natchez, Mississippi. He marries a woman named Margaret Ellis, and they have two children together, but unfortunately she ends up dying of yellow fever in 1815, and he inherits everything. However, the Ellis family does take the children back into their care and end up grooming them into the planter way of life, making him not only an overnight millionaire, but a bachelor and widower as well. Now, he does marry well again. He marries a woman named Catherine Bingaman, who was heavily regarded as one of the most beautiful but also brightest people here in Natchez, Mississippi at the time. And together, using the fortune that he amassed from his prior wife, Margaret Ellis, are able to become the wealthiest family here in Natchez and later end up purchasing this house around 1821 to 1823. 
Now, Stephen Duncan was a member of the American Colonization Society, and if you are unfamiliar with that organization, they are a very early abolitionist group founded by men like Abraham Lincoln. They later go on to purchase the large plot of land on the west coast of Africa that is still called Liberia today. That was purchased as essentially early reparations, thinking that the formerly enslaved people after emancipation was to come into law would want to travel back to Africa. However, I don't think they considered that traveling the ocean in 1865 isn't exactly ideal, nor the fact that most of their family has been here for six to seven, maybe even 10 generations, and their culture has essentially been stripped away from them entirely. So not a lot of people ended up taking them up on that offer. So as we enter the library, we can see that there are some major differences in the floor construction. In the main 1812 section of the house, all the floors are made out of cypress and they're actually irregularly cut. And that is because there was no lumber mill here in 1812. So these wings being added on in 1856, we have the new advent of very regularly cut pine wood floors. Heart pine became the new popular wood of choice at that point as well. Now, if we look over here, we can see the portrait of George Davis. George Davis actually lived in this house from 1863 until 1911. He became the caretaker of this house when the Duncan family leaves here in 1863. Stephen Duncan wrote prolifically that if Mississippi were to secede from the Union, that he would never return. And in 1863, he does just that. He has a Union gunboat come down the Mississippi River, pick him and his entire family up, that includes five children, starting here in 1823 and moves them to New York City, where he spends the rest of his life. He later ends up dying in 1868, and his wife Catherine shortly after. But all the while, George Davis was in charge of this house. He was also overseeing a lot of major changes, and then while his two youngest sons, Henry and Stephen Duncan Jr., were periodically coming back here to essentially spend their father's money traveling the world and using this as a bachelor pad, uh, would keep up with George Davis. And we have a letter that was written from George Davis in 1876 to Master Stephen Duncan Jr. before he was about to go over to Europe. He very politely expresses the state of the house, but then in the PS line alone is scalding Henry for not having stayed here long enough to mend the horse fences because the horses kept getting out, but then also in the same breath is asking Stephen to bring him back a pocket watch when he comes back from Europe. So a very interesting interpersonal relationship that we see between the former enslaved and the children of the former slave owner. Now, if you notice in the picture that we have of George Davis, he's standing right here in the library. He was actually standing right behind me in front of those library cabinets, and I'm sure you noticed that they are painted a little bit differently. They were originally the flame mahogany faux bois that was the campaign that was in the main 1812 section of the house that they carried over along with them in the 1856 period. It is awfully shameful that it was covered up, but hopefully one day that will be uncovered. 
Now, from up here, we can see how this railing continuously runs around and then goes back down along the other side, being one continuous piece of railing. But what I also love about this railing is it is modern day code height, kind of debunking the apocryphal myth that people were just shorter back then. I don't know if you've heard this in any of your architectural tours before. This happens a lot in New England where the ceilings are much shorter, trying to keep in heat during the winter. But here in the South, you usually have much higher ceilings and then you would have much higher railing. It's not so much that they were concerned about how short the people were, because in my own personal opinion, people have been people-sized for at least the last 500 years. George Washington was about 6'4", Napoleon was about 5'8", so if that puts anything into perspective for you, there you go. But we have this very code height railing primarily because of this enormously tall ceiling. They were very interested in scale and ratio during the federal period. So the federal period homes in New England where the ceilings were say seven and a half feet to eight feet tall from Standing far back in the room, you would not want to see your railing being half the height of your ceiling. You would want it to be a much more pleasing ratio, somewhere around the golden ratio, which is one to one sixteenth of the scale of the room. Now, one final thing about this staircase is you'll notice how narrow it is once we have finally ascended. And that is largely due to the fact that the fashionable silhouette for ladies at the time was the empire waist. And if you're unfamiliar with that, you know, you have the dresses that cut right under the bust and then fall straight to the floor. This is about 20 years before the hoop skirt came into fashion. But interestingly, this was the only staircase in the house for the entire time that it was a private residence for 99 years. So this staircase had to accommodate all of those large bustle gowns, cage crinolines, and hoop skirts throughout the 19th century. Now, if you notice here, we have triple sash windows. They were able to raise all the way up to the bottom of the top sash so that people would be able to walk straight out onto the balcony. Now, we don't only have that here, but there are three triple sash windows across the front under this portico and the same downstairs on either side of the front door. Now here on the second floor, I want to draw your attention to the high ornamented architecture. As you would come up these stairs, you would be instantly greeted with the exact same architectural elements as you saw on the first floor, which is incredibly rare, especially for this time period. Usually your upstairs is not going to be a very public space. It's going to be very private. So you would not want to spend all the money on the architraves and entablatures and the barrel coved ceiling that we have downstairs as well. But in this house, it's a little bit different. Our architect is coming from New York City and is essentially designing what he knows how to build. This is the first house he designs when he comes here from New York City. So in New York City, you've got all of your public spaces to the back of the house where we have the sitting room that's downstairs as well as the dining room but upstairs we have a rare formal sitting room this was also to be the receiving room that was originally the design so you would have your guests come into the house whether or not they were familiar with the family they would all be coming upstairs and they would be brought into this room that we'll see in a moment that was the formal sitting room this is where they would have thrown all of their money all of the best architraves and entablatures the most intricately carved mantelpieces and the best wall treatments would be reserved for this room as you would have your dignitaries and people calling on you here in this house where you would do all of your formal business dealings. They would likely never see any other room in the house other than the incredible hall, the room that they were just in, and the staircase that they would come up and go down. Now here in this upstairs sitting room or formal receiving room as it would have been in 1812, we have another set of incredibly carved architraves and entablatures that would have been done by Levi Weeks, or we suspect would have been done by Levi Weeks. This is another pattern that they likely would have picked out from a book like the Salmon's Palladio Londenesis out of 1735, the very quintessential broken pediment at the top. We have a beautiful architrave, and across the entablature, we have the very highly sought after acanthus leaf. Now this exquisitely carved mantle that's behind me is the last ornately carved mantle that we have in the house that would have been done by our famed murderer, Levi Weeks. This would have been done in 1812 and it is a very high style for the federal period. Um, again, because this is the most formal room in the house where you would have been having all of your very formal business dealings. Um, this is what we assume that they looked like downstairs in the dining room and in the formal living room, though we believe the style would have been a little bit different. 
The other marble mantles that are downstairs were already created for coal, which was the height of technology for uh, burning and keeping your house warm, but this one had to be retrofitted for coal. So we have the introduction of this marble coming in to cover the fireplace surround that originally would have been plaster, and then we have this cast iron surround that was built in and a new firebox constructed. Now on this window, we have the signature of our original homeowner. Lyman Harding signs this probably at 1812, but it could have been as late as 1820. It was a very rare find and we were very excited. So now we are in the West Wing that was added on in 1856, and this is a private bedroom that was added on in 1856. Now keep in mind, they started having children in this house in 1823. By 1856, they were all young adults and of marrying age. This room was never intended to be for a child. It was likely intended to entice the children to stay here in this home, to have their own private families, and in which case they would need their own private bedrooms to do so. Now, if you'll notice behind me, we have a faux marble mantelpiece. This is made out of scagliola. And scagliola was originally intended to be a cost-saving measure for large municipal buildings in the early 19th century. We can see that it is broken, and we love that because we can actually see the original construction method. We see this very porous under concrete that was actually put in after. Essentially, it was made in a giant mold, kind of like a chocolatier's mold, and you would pour in your marbled and dyed finished concrete that was a much finer quality. Once that was set and dried, you could then pour in your very porous, lesser quality concrete and then flip it out and this could be polished. It was then assembled and we have this very faux marble finish mantle. By the middle of the 19th century, this was all the rage. And like other trends that usually start as cost-saving measures, it became extremely popular for the wealthy elite. Now that we're out here on the second floor of the back gallery, we can see the very large difference between the front of the house, which is neoclassical in design, we now have the Greek Revival influence. This double back gallery was added on in the 1856 period, the same time that they started making all of the massive changes with the wings. And we have the very simple Greek Revival style columns. We also have the simple Greek Revival style on the kitchen house over here. So we do have our original kitchen house from 1812 that also got a very trendy facelift with the Duncan family. It originally housed an enslaved family. Below was the kitchen and to the back was the laundry. We also have our original larder from the 1812 period. From the back here, we can also see the billiards hall, also added on in 1856, which was likely the brainchild of the very smart woman named Catherine Bingaman, later Catherine Bingaman Duncan, who had several rambunctious young boys who kept getting in trouble under the hill. She built them a billiards hall so that they could entertain their friends and not break anything in her house, but also would not be under the hill causing trouble. Well, thank you for coming to visit me at this National Historic Landmark here in Natchez, Mississippi. Um, if we did not mention it before, it was donated to the city of Natchez in 1911. All 220 of its original acres were donated to the city then, and they got right to work turning it into a beautiful park. We have acres and acres of beautiful golf course. We have a playground over here to the right of me. I don't know if you can hear those children playing. Uh, we have lots of tennis courts and even a disc golf course that goes around to the front of the house. So if you are coming here, not only for a tour, you can also stay here and enjoy the grounds.